Какому городу нраві права, всякий имеет свою ум голова, всякому сердцу своя есть любовь, всякому горну свой вкус хоть яков. В мене одна тільки в світі дума, в мене одна тільки не без ума. Чи нову глипанські гітере, Хведор купець при горшині солже, Той доми строїть на новий манір, Той все в процентах пожали провір. В мене одна тільки в світі дума, В мене одна тільки не йде сума. На світ он юриста права, з диспут студенту трещить голова, тих безпокоїть Венери на мур, всякою голову мучить свой дур. В мене одна тільки в світі дума, в мене одна тільки не йде з ума, і як би умерти мені не без ума, і як би умерти мені не без ума. Страшна, замашна, як осов, Ти не щадиш і царських волосов, Ти не глядиш, де мужик, а де цар, Все жереш так, як солому пожар. Хто на її плюне гострою став, Той чия совість, як чистий хруста. Ж не правда, увесь світ зажерла. Thank you. 
сошлого Господь з неба благодаті. Бо сам Господь правда сокрушить неправду, сумирить горди. Містечку Богославку Каньовського пана Там гуляла бондарівна, як пишна я пала У містечку Богославку сидить діва кубка Меж ними бондарівна, як сива До них пан Каньовський ще й шапочку її зняв, обідняв він бондарівно та й поцілував. Ой, не годен пан Каньовський мене цілувати, тільки годен пан Каньовський мене розувати. Шепнули подруженьки бондарівні тихо, тікай, тікай, бондарівно, буде тобі лихо. Ой, тікала бондарівна по межі домами, а за нею два жовніри з гострими шаблями. Прицілився пан Каньовський з срібної рушниці. Ой, чи волиш бондарівно і зо мною жити, а чи волиш бондарівно в сирі землі? В сирі землі гнити, ніж з тобою по неволі на цім світі жити. Ой, як тільки бонда рівна, та те я сказала, ой, вистрели пан Каньовський бонда рівна. Свою дочку в той світ виряжати. У нашої бондарівни червоні її стрічки, куди несли бондарівну криваві. Дарили в усі дзвони, музики заграли, А вже дівку Бонда рівно на віки сховали. А вже дівку Бонда рівно на віки сховали.
дворяночка була, та дворянська жона пивом вином частувала, компанію собі мала, свого милого благала, побачиш си величала, побачиш си величала, голубчиком називала. Синький голубчику сивесенький, продай милий сиві бички, купи мені черевички, бо я панського роду не ходила, боса з роду. Продай коняшій кобилу, купи краски та пілила, щоб яличка накрасила, щоб красива я ходила. Усе з двору збуває, свою милу наряжає, Та на неї поглядає, гарно мила походжає, Немов пава пропливає. Сидить мила за паніла, чорт мадровні поліна, Нічим хати протопити, борщу каші наварити. Загадала жона мужу, та ще й гіршою нужу в ліс по дрова та сходити, борщу каші наварити, борщу каші наварити, дрібних діток накормити. Милий думає, гадає, дубовий візок ладнає, свою милу запрягає, дубиною поганяє. Гей, сопа, я мила, гей, сапе, чорна мрива, гей, мила, не панися, та в оглоблі становися, хоч ти панського роду не ходила в возі з роду. Під'їжджає до лісу, ставить милу злу, як біса, гей, пані моя люба, Становися коло дуба, та дивись, що моя мила, щоб ти дуба не звалила. А сам милий добре дбає, та по лісу походжає, та все дрова відбирає, сухесеньки відкидає, сухесеньки відкидає, а сиреньких набирає, щоб бач, важче було. Став додому повертати, милу в гору підганять, Гей, тпррррр, моття мила, щоб ти воза не розбила. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome, welcome. It's a little warmer this evening than it was yesterday evening. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Uh, my name is Cecilia Rubino. I'm the director of the Lang College Theater Program. And this amazing privilege that we've had um, over the last two days to honor and to celebrate Ping Chong and his company with this astonishing series, Undesirable Elements, comes to an end this evening um, with a 30-minute excerpt of a new piece, Undesirable Elements, Ukraine. But I also want to say that this collaboration um, between Lang College and the College of Performing Arts, um, shout out to Stephen Brownfried, my colleague here, um, and Ping Chong and company who have worked extensively both with Lang College and with the College of Performing Arts is just again an honor and a privilege. So thank you so much for being here. After the excerpt of the piece, um, there will be a talk back. Um, lots of things to think about, to address, but what's centered in Ping Chong and company's work are voices, people's stories, as they intersect um, with really important human rights questions. So again, appreciate your presence and welcome.
Починаємо. Let's get started. Please sit. Бандура. 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 The bandura is a traditional Ukrainian musical instrument that combines elements of a zither and a lute. For centuries, kobzari, wandering blind singers, used the bandura to accompany epic songs. In the 1920s, urban musicians took up the instrument. They formed ensembles and made larger banduras with 50 or more strings. Все змінюється з часом. Time changes things. Things change in time. I am a third generation bandura player, singer, and composer. Blue and yellow. Blue and yellow. Blue and yellow. Blue and yellow. The Ukrainian flag, blue and yellow, reflects a vast sky above a vast field of golden wheat that goes on and on and on for as far as the eye can see. Ukraine's the breadbasket of Europe and today for the Middle East as well. This is why it has been coveted by so many empires for so long. In my father's living room, there is a glass bowl filled with the black earth of Ukraine. G-E-N-O-C-I-D-E. Genocide. In Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, ratified in 1948 by the United Nations, genocide is defined as follows. A. Killing members of the group. B. B causing serious bodily or mortal harm to members of the group. C. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. D. D. Imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. E. e. Forcibly transferring children of a group to another group. 149 countries have ratified the Genocide Convention. Genocide, genocide is, is a war crime. crime. In modern times, there have been three genocides in Ukraine. One against the Ukrainian people. Which continues as we speak. One against the Jewish people in the Holocaust. And one against the Crimean Tatars, which continues as we speak. Eighteen seventy six. Eighteen seventy six. The Tsar, ruler of the Russian Empire, restricts the use of the Ukrainian language. Ukrainian books, newspapers, and concerts are banned in colonized Ukraine. In the countryside, the wandering Bandura players are the remaining carriers of news, history, and cultural tradition. Russia боїться зростання української самосвідомості. Russia fears the rise of Ukrainian identity. 1910. 1910. It's the peak of the first migration of Ukrainians to America. They come in search of a better life. Among them are Onufri Stetsko and Maria Kukura. These two young people will become my grandparents. 1912. 1912. FOB. Fresh, Fresh off, off the, the boat. boat. A young woman from Ukraine named Katerina Zinyak arrives to the chaos of Ellis Island. Katerina is completely alone. She arrives without a sponsor. If you arrive at Ellis Island without a sponsor, you stand on a block and people looking for workers check you out. Okay, I'll take that one. You can't get into the country unless somebody gives you a job. Katerina gets a job as a live-in domestic. She will become my paternal grandmother. 1918. 1918. 1918. 1918. Незалежна Україна! An, An independent, independent Ukraine. Ukraine.
But soon they will be part of the Bandura Chorus and will bring Bandura music to North America. 1929. He flees to the Donbass region and hides among the miners. Faith has become <laughs> an, an undesirable element. In the 1930s, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian artists, intellectuals, and teachers are executed or banished to Siberia. The tradition of the wandering Bandura players or Kobzari comes to an end. The erasure of Ukrainian culture continues. The, the terror, terror continues. continues. 1932. 1932. Holodomor. Death by hunger. Russia's dictator, Joseph Stalin, tries to collectivize resistant Ukrainian farmers. The result is a man-made famine. If farmers fail to meet the government grain quota, they are denied any grain to feed themselves. Katarina is the youngest of 13 children. She is starving. Her mother puts her on a train for Belarus where there is food. Then she reluctantly leaves her child. She will never see Katarina again. On the way home, her mother is killed for a small piece of bread. Will the child live? Will Katarina survive? Will the child live? She lives. She will become my great-grandmother. 1933. 1933. Holodomor continues. Fenya is a child. Her siblings are dying one by one from starvation. Her mother goes to the train station. Take my child. Take my child. Desperate Ukrainians try to flee, but the borders are closed. They are doomed. At least four million people die of starvation. My grandmother Fenia survives, but at what cost? 1942. 1942. World War II. The Germans now occupy Ukraine. They are as brutal as the Russians. The Ukrainian Bandura Chorus, which includes my family, are deported by the Nazis to a German labor camp. 14-year-old Petro Ketasti is among them. Petro doesn't know it yet, but he will become my father. Five months pass. Miraculously, all 17 members of the Ukrainian Bandura Chorus survive the labor camp. Miraculously, the musicians are allowed to perform again. But only in one German labor camp after another. And another. And another. For enslaved Ukrainian workers. How many of them will survive the war?
1944. 1944. 1944. Moscow. Lavrenti Beria, the head of the secret police, accuses the Crimean Tatar people of collaborating with the Nazis. He convinces Stalin to punish them. Years later, this would be debunked by the KGB itself. But in the present moment, the consequences for Crimean Tatars are catastrophic. 1944. 1944. 1944. 1944. 1944. 1944. 1944. 1944. May 18, 1944. Simferopol, Crimea. There are loud knocks on the door. Russian soldiers appeared with the loaded rifles. 14-year-old Usain Asanov doesn't know what happened. You have 15 minutes. To gather your belongings. Hussein asks his mother. Can I take my violin? No, no, stay with me. You are not taking anything. Will the Russians take the family out and shoot them? It is total chaos. Almost the entire population of Crimean Tatars are deported in sealed cattle cars. Those who resist are shot. 80,000 homes and 360,000 acres of land are stolen by the Russians. Thousands of people will die on the two-week journey, and thousands more will die later. The train takes Hussein and other Crimean Tatars thousands of miles from their homeland to Siberia. He doesn't know it yet, but Hussein Asanov will become my father. 1944. 1944. 1944. Nazis occupy the city Odessa. They are looking for Jews. Some are shot in the street in the blink of an eye. Some are burned alive screaming. Because of the history of anti-Semitism in Ukraine, many Jews convert to the Orthodox faith. A young mother named Shayna make this choice. She changes her name from Shayna to Evgenia, hoping to avoid the stigma. But a neighbor wants her land and denounces Evgenia. Then the Nazis come. One, two, three eternities pass. Evgenia's German mother-in-law, Frau Helen, confronts the Nazis with the fiery invectives and colorful profanities. The, the Nazis, Nazis back, back off. off. Even though Evgenia and Frau Helen don't like each other, Evgenia's life is spared. If she was not spared, I would not be here now. She will become my great-grandmother. Between 1941 and 1944, 1 1.2 to 1 1.5 million Ukrainian Jews are murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators. Ordinary citizens risk losing their lives if they do not collaborate. 1949. 1949. 1949. Buffalo, New York. Ukrainian youth gather for the Ukrainian Catholic Youth Conference. On a break, two boys are teasing a girl by tossing her hat from one to another. The girl sees a young man watching and says, Are you in charge here? No, I'm not in charge here. You're on the committee, aren't you? Yeah. Will you please ask them to give me back my hat? He gets her hat back, and she disappears into a crowd of 400. The young man says, Hey, wait a minute. Who was that beautiful girl? If George Drantz and Irene Stetsko had not met that day, I would not be here now. They become my parents. 1953. 1953. Stalin dies, then Beria is executed. Many Crimean Tatars, including Hussein's family, move to Uzbekistan. We want to return home to Crimea. We, we are, are Crimean Tatars. Tatars. But Crimea is now mostly Russian. The Crimean Tatars are forbidden to return. 1966. 1966. West Hempstead, Long Island. God bless Danny, Donna, Donna Greggy, Greggy, Chrissy, Tommy. Tommy. Mickey and Georgie. Georgie. Bless Nana Steko, Grandpa Steko, Nana Drance, Grandpa Drance, and all our relatives and friends and make us all good people. Amen. Amen. Faith comes when I'm with my grandmother. Faith comes in the books and the icons. Faith comes in my family discussions at the dinner table. Faith is everywhere in my life. 
1967. 1967. The capital of Uzbekistan. the Kremlin Tatar boy is now a man. He is aware that what he is going to do is dangerous. He could go to jail. He and 11 other Crimeans organized a major protest, demanding to return to Crimea. A young woman named Ilmira Abdul Haq, a student, joins the protest. When the police come, the protesters join arms. Return, Return our people to our homeland! Return our people to our homeland! Eleven are tried. Hussein is imprisoned for three years. Elmira serves three months and is expelled from her university. There will be many more protests and many more jails for Hussein and Elmira because they want to go back to Crimea. They don't know it yet, but Hussein and Elmira will become my parents. 1971. 1971. Long Island. I'm in the fourth grade when my teacher says, My horse is named Kiev. Why did you name your horse Kiev? Well, it's the name of an old Russian capital. Excuse me, Miss Byrne. Yes, George. But uh, Kiev is Ukrainian, not Russian. The teacher does not like George's answer. Then there's the question. Where are you from? We're Ukrainian. Yeah, yeah Russian. Russian. It's the Cold War. Russians are the enemy. We are? Undesirable elements. 1973. 1973. Canada. I am 15. I'm at a music camp my father organized north of Toronto. It isn't going well. I feel the bandura is playing me. That afternoon, I sit down and play one exercise over and over and over. I don't know it yet. But that is the afternoon I become a Bandura player. 1978. 1978. We live in Uzbekistan. But in my house, all I hear, Kharam, Kharam, Kharam. Crimean, Crimean, Crimean. I ask my mom. Mom, mom, is Karakoz our dog Crimean? Yes, my mom. Our Ma dog is Crimean. Mom, mom, is Marquise our cat Crimean? Yes, our cat is Crimean, Marquis. Even the sheep are Crimean. I am five years old. 1979. 1979. I am on a tour of North America with my elders in the Ukrainian Bandura Chorus. I love the Bandura, my instrument. I love the musician's wandering life. I never want to stop. So I don't. 1980. 1980. 1980. The clock strikes 8 p.m. It's Wednesday night. And I run to TV. For just 15 stingy minutes a week, state TV allows Crimean Tatars music and dance. And when I hear violin, I say, Ben Bunu Chalmak Steve. Ben Bunu Chalmak Steve. I want to play that. I want to play that.
1982. 1982. 1982. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Marquette University. A, A Catholic, Catholic University. University. I pursue my lifelong passion, which is the theater. I'm on an acting scholarship, which is very encouraging, but I'm becoming an awful human being. I'm becoming unpleasantly competitive, aggressive, and self-centered. Is this all there is to acting in the theater? 1983. 1983. 1983. As time goes by, I enter a spiritual path through imaginative prayer and meditation. I become a member of the Society of Jesus, a Jesuit. 1985. 1985. Odessa. I love the smell of the sea. I love the smell of boat grease. My father, Anatoly, is a boat captain for the city of Odessa. He is in love with the sea. He brings me to the boat yard and then goes to do whatever a boat captain does. I'm really happy because nobody tells me what to do. One day, I get up on the box filled with sand the sailors used to put out fires. I start to sing. 10 minutes pass. 20 minutes pass. 30 minutes pass. The time flies by. I don't know it yet, but it is my first concert of many to come. I'm six years old. 1985. 1985. 1985. My sister Yulia and I are visiting my grandma Fenia. It is not the visit we look forward to. She never throws out any food, even the little worms. A crawling all over it. She picks out the seeds from the garbage and cooks them. Grandma Fenia was never the same after she survived Holodomor. The, the death, death by hunger. hunger. Out of 12 siblings, 11 died. She's the only survivor. 1988. 1988. 1988. Five. Ten. Fifteen. Twenty years have passed since their first protest. My mother and father cannot wait anymore, nor can the rest of the Crimean Tatars. They want to go home. Then it happens. Then, then it, it happens. happens. The Russians cannot believe their eyes. Thousands and thousands of Crimean Tatars go home. It is completely illegal, but they go home anyway. My mother says, This is our land, the land of our grandparents. Now it's your land. 1989. 1989. The Soviet economy is collapsing. As part of the Soviet Union, Ukraine is suffering too. There is no money. There is no food. Store shelves are empty. Everyone is hungry. 1990. 1990. 1990. Simferopol, Crimea. The sad truth is that the Russians are majority in Crimea now. Everything we had was taken away. We are the new poor in our own homeland. Time passes. Despite the prejudice, I make some Russian friends. After a while, one says, they told us you would come and kill us. They said you had antlers growing out of your head like bloody animals. We believe them. It's a fake news. We are undesirable, undesirable elements. elements. 1990. 1990. 1990. I am at the junior music college. We are outside smoking. Ali Alim of the choreographer says, I'm creating a Crimean dance group. I need musicians. I joined the Uchansu ensemble. This encounter will change my life, but I don't know it yet. 1991. 1991. 1991. The American Association of Crimean Tatars invites us to perform in New York. They greet us at JFK. Where are we going? Brooklyn, Brooklyn Brighton, Brighton Beach. Beach. That's where immigrants from the Soviet Union live. Everybody speaks Russian there. In the following days, we see the tall buildings of Manhattan. Yellow taxis. The MetLife building. There's a road that goes right through it. Amazing. Amazing. People of all colors dressed in jeans and sipping soda. Let's go to McDonald's. Hooray. Hooray. Ooh, the smell. I force myself to take one bite. But I love the French fries. We perform all over the New York City, including UN. 
1991. 1991. The Soviet Union falls apart. It's a complete shock. A dream come true. Ukraine declares its independence. 1992. 1992. Even though we have nothing, my family never stops supporting my father's impossible dream. To race a yacht To build a yacht. Is, Is this, this an, an impossible dream? dream? 1994. 1994. My father, Anatolis, dreamed of sailing 32,000 miles around the world comes true against tremendous at the Ardessa 200, built entirely by hand by my father and crew, becomes a legend. 1994. 1994. Uchansu, our Crimean Tatar ensemble returns to New York City. The last concert is at Columbia University. I decide to defect. The handlers are watching them very closely. Very closely. Will I succeed? One, two, three eternities pass. I don't show up for the concert. A man named Artem Lapa takes me to Jamaica, Queens to hide. A year and a half later, I ask for asylum. I don't know it yet but I will never see my mother again. 1995. 1995. I'm studying economics, but singing is what I really love. I sing representing my school. <clears throat> More than going to class. Soon I find myself singing in one event after another. Then, Lesia is invited to perform at the Ukrainian palace in Kyiv. Palaz Ukraina! I step out on stage, and just as I am about to sing, there is a blackout. <laughs> oh, what should I do? I do the only thing I know how to do. Chornarilla. <laughs> Izorana, hey, hey, Chorna Rilla, Izorana, Sheikula, me, Zasiana, hey, hey, Sheikula, me, Zasiana. Everyone's surprise, including myself. I win second place. My destiny as a singer begins. I'm 16 years old. 1995. 1995. 1995. Time passes. I think I'm going to have to give up acting, but my religious superiors say... You know, George, everywhere you've been these last 10 years, you always seem to be engaged in theater even in your service. What makes the Jesuits distinct is the spirituality of seeking and finding God in all things. I commit to my dual calling, which is in fact one. 2002. 2002. 2002. I'm a singer in a band. We're playing Ukrainian folk music, but in a modern way. We get an invitation to play in competition at Artek, the famous youth camp in beautiful Crimea. The coolest part of it is called Seaside, Seaside Camp, where all the rich, spoiled Russian kids go. When they see us coming, they look us up and down. Look, the Ukrainian peasants who speak Russian badly are here. We are undesirable, undesirable elements. elements. But when the Ukrainian peasants start singing, the Russians are shocked. Oh my god! That sounds so cool. We don't have any music like that. 2004. 2004. Money is flowing in Moscow. 
I'm invited to perform at Gus Golder Club. I bring my band Freedom. Bright, Bright lights, lights, big city. city. Oh, I'm like Alice in Wonderland. Gus Golder is a private art center with restaurants, galleries, and a huge dance floor serving the wealthy Russian elite. We are like kids in a candy store. Cocaine and drugs for days. But Lesia doesn't need it. It's a dream job. I'm 25 years old. 2004. 2004. 2004. The pro-Russian candidate Viktor Yanukovych blatantly steals the presidential election. Half a million peaceful protesters pour in from all over the country to the central square in Kyiv. The Maidan, the heart of Ukraine. This landmark event is called the, the Orange Revolution. Revolution. In a do-over election, the pro-Ukrainian candidate Yushchenko wins. People start speaking Ukrainian instead of Russian on the street. Ukrainian is no longer the language of a colonized people. This is the beginning of my political engagement. 2005. 2005. Kyiv. I am studying broadcast media. It's no longer Soviet-style fake news from the top down. I remember when they only broadcast Russian pop. For better or for worse, free enterprise comes to Ukraine. The world opens up. I start working in entertainment news on TV. I become a TV host, a presenter. I'm used to being in front of people. 2007. 2007. 2007. I'm cast in the first reality show in the history of Ukraine. Factory, Factory of, of the Stars! stars. For three months, a group of singers live together, entertain, and compete. Then, one by one, we are eliminated. Like on American Idol. Or Big Brother. I'm there almost to the end. Afterwards, people notice me. Hi, Dario! Okay, I'm a celebrity now. Then, I get to host a TV show. Teen, Teen time. time! My life is on the fast track. I'm 19 years old. 2010. 2010. 2010. Moscow. Is the dream job still a dream job? Cocaine and drugs for days. Dancing from midnight to 5 a.m. They aren't even listening to my music. After six years in Moscow, I feel empty. I'm going home. 2013. 2013. 2013. November 2013. Viktor Yanukovych, the pro-Russian who lost the redo election, is now president of Ukraine. Under pressure from the Ukrainian people, he is about to sign a treaty with the European Union. Which could bring Ukraine one step closer to the West. At the last minute, Putin forces Yanukovych to break it off. Will the dream of a Ukraine free of Russian influence be deferred? Mustafa Nayem, a young Afghan-Ukrainian journalist, posts on Facebook. Come to the Maidan. Likes don't count. Outraged students gather again on the Maidan in Kyiv to protest. The students are brutally beaten by police goons. Ukrainian parents say, They, they have, have no right, right to, to beat, beat our children. children. Hundreds of thousands pour into the Maidan. The revolution of dignity begins. I want to support the protest on my TV show, but the team says, Daria, we're entertainment TV. We don't need this. No, guys. We need to talk about this. Our people are getting killed. How are we free people if we can't speak freely? 2014. 2014. 2014. Snipers kill 100 protesters. The country erupts. Viktor Yanukovych flees in a helicopter to Russia. 2015. 2015. I don't want to do entertainment TV anymore. I make a list of what I really want to do with my life. It's all music. I love music. I do live streams for the first internet radio. I perform live on stage as a DJ. I play jazz festivals, clubs, and private parties. I create an app. Music Cures. 2015. 
2022. February 24th, 2022. Kyiv. My sister calls. Daria, the war started. I don't believe her. I go to the window. Suddenly there is a massive explosion. I freeze. I'm in shock. How could this happen in the 21st century? The telephone rings and rings and rings. It's my mother. Come to Cherkasy. It will be safer here. I don't want to leave. Air raid sirens are wailing. I go down the street to my favorite cafe. There's a basement there. There are 40 of us. It's hard and cold in the basement. When I'm weak or want to cry, I wrap my great-grandmother Katarina's scarf around me. My great-grandmother survived Stalin's famine. Holodomor. I will survive, too. War can happen anywhere. It can happen right here, in this room where you are sitting. This theater could be blown up in minutes. We must fight for every human being rights to live. In the cafe basement, we start singing Ukrainian songs. unites and comforts us. This is the power of music. 2022. 2022. From the basement of the cafe, I write a message to my very closest people. If I don't wake up tomorrow, this is the password for my Music Cures app. I understand my mission, what I want to last, even if they kill me, to play Ukrainian music, to spread Ukrainian culture around the world, because I love music, and I really love my country. My name is Nariman Asanov. I am Crimean Tatar. I was born on September 6, 1973 at 5 p.m. in the city of Almalik in Uzbekistan. It was early autumn. Lesa. My name is Lesa Verba. I was born on May 19, 1979 at 5.30 p.m. in Odessa, Ukraine. It was the end of spring. George. My name is Yuri Volodymyr Drantz, Jr. I was born on August 21st, 1962 at Mary Immaculate Hospital in Jamaica, Queens. It was summer. Nancy? My name is Nancy MacArthur. I am reading for Daria Kolomietz, who had to return to Ukraine. She was born on August 9th, 1988 in Cherkasy in central Ukraine. It was summer. Julian? My name is Julian Katasti. I was born on January 23rd, 1958 at Mercy Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. It was in the middle of the night. It was winter.
Thank you everyone for coming tonight. We're going to have a short Q&A with some of the cast members and the creative team in about two minutes. So please stick around for the Q&A if you can, or if you need to make a swift departure, now is your moment. members uh, resetting backstage, I'm going to invite Rolana Koch, Ping Chong, and Dr. Oksana Kies to come join us on stage. Any seat. And I'm Sarah Zatz, I'm the Associate Director of Ping Chong and Company, and um, some of you have been here throughout this two-day symposium celebrating the 30th anniversary of Undesirable Elements, so thank you for being with us throughout. This is our last event, and uh, greetings to those of you who are walking on the live stream. Yes, let's welcome Julian back out. And we're going to welcome George back out. And I'm going to introduce our uh, new guests, and I'm going to ask a few questions to the group, and then we'll turn it over to you for questions. So uh, I'd like to introduce Verlana Koch, the Artistic Director of Yara Arts Group. <laughs> Dr. Oksana Kies, who is, the, who is the head of the Department of Social Anthropology at the Institute of Ethnology National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine, and also a visiting scholar here at New School. Ping Chong, the Artistic Director Emeritus of Ping Chong and Company. And you all had a chance to meet George and Julian already. So I'm going to uh, throw out sort of one question to everyone and then uh, turn it over to the audience. So actually, George, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind. So um, as you heard, George is an actor. Uh, usually our Undesirable Elements productions feature people who are not professional actors telling their true stories on stage, but George is in fact a professional actor. And you've worked with Ping many times on different projects, so I'd love to just ask you as an actor, what was it like and how was it different for you performing in a piece um, where you are actually telling your own story on stage? Well, uh, first of all, it's uh, a lot of gratitude and a great honor to be able to do that. Not only to, uh, to be able to tell my story, but to have my story woven together with so many beautiful stories from such amazing people and to, to share the time and, and the process and the stage with them has really been uh, an amazing experience for me. Uh, I think one of the things that I always look for in a project is uh, why is it important that I do it? And there was absolutely no question about that for this project. It was, uh, it was very important, and it continues to be important. And I'm very grateful to Ping and to Verlana for having these stories told and for keeping, uh, in America we have a very short attention span, and it's very easy for us to forget about uh, what's going on on the other side of the world when we get a little too tired of it. Um, but to weave it into these personal stories that bring the story home and just talk person to person is, I think, theater at its core. Thank you. And Julian, you are also you know, a professional musician. I know your family story was featured in a documentary. I don't know if you've ever told your own personal story in that context before. So for you as a performer, how do you feel telling your own story through words rather than through music? Well, it was, uh, it was different. <laughs> <laughs> But you know I, what I what really struck me about this uh, this performance as it developed was just how much uh, our seemingly very different stories dovetailed. You know, like uh, when George was uh, telling about that experience with his grade grade school teacher, you know, and this denial of Ukraine's right to exist. 
You know, th that was completely my experience. And it was, uh, it was really good to have a chance to talk about it, you know, with, uh, like this. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things we talk about with Undesirable Elements is the power of claiming your story in public and really having the chance to own your story, especially when maybe other people or other powers have imposed a story or a narrative on you. So uh, Dr. Keese, I know of your many credentials, one is that you are uh, one of the co-founders of the Ukrainian Oral History Foundation Association. So, you know, as a scholar of oral history, um, I know this is a new form for you, this Undesirable Elements form specifically, and you were able to come to rehearsal. So I'd love to invite your response as a, you know, as a scholar and also as a Ukrainian. Oh, thank you. For me, that was a completely new experience to observe how oral history could be actually performed publicly as, um, as something private becoming political something personal becoming political. But as a historian, I was um, thinking over, you know, since uh, the day I had the chance and privilege to attend the rehearsal, and today again I was thinking about, you know, Ukrainian history as such and the role of oral history in uh, actually rectifying all those distortions we had with our national history over the centuries, but especially in the 20th century. Uh, let me tell another uh, short story. There is a museum, Territory of Terror, in the city of Lviv, the municipal um, memorial museum which opened in 2015. And uh, that museum is about commemorating the victims of the Soviet totalitarian regime in Ukraine. But the story is about a different thing. Uh, at a certain point, that museum was given um, some space, some premises for their administrative uh, uses. And it used to be like a small local library in quite neglected condition. So they started the renovation and suddenly they discovered that uh, there, there was an original painting uh, on the walls of those rooms they used. Uh, the, the, the artistic painting of Jewish origin, obviously, very beautiful one like frescoes, but it was painted over and covered with all those cheap wallpapers for the keys since the Soviet times. So they started this re restoration work and they um, opened up those frescoes and it turned out that most of it, great part of it was destroyed, was lost forever, was erased in a way. So it reminds me the, the history of Ukraine itself because for, for centuries and for decades, it was deliberately destroyed and distorted and manipulated and falsified and in, in, at certain point even, you know, weaponized against Ukrainians themselves and always the aim, you know, to uh, basically to substitute, to replace the actual historical memory of Ukrainian people with that uh, Soviet or Russian imperial narrative in order to destroy not only the memory itself but the, the very identity of the Ukrainian people. So um, oral history could be very helpful in that. Um, in, uh, it, it, it was proven in many post-totalitarian societies that oral history could be like Mm, indispensable in recovering, reclaiming, um, retrieving the, the, the history which was lost or distorted or deliberately um, misrepresented. Um, and that reclaiming of the past through the personal memories, the family memories, um, is not only to fill the gaps or to somehow rectify uh, the the, those distortions, uh, but uh, basically it's the way for, for the people to reclaim, to regain their historical agency, to become the subjects of history again, and to raise their voice in reconstructing their own history through their personal stories, um, to become the entitled witnesses of the history who can either confirm or actually disprove 
all the narratives which were imposed on them. So for me, the way it was performed here was extremely powerful exactly in terms of becoming the witness and the agents of reconstruction of the history of Ukraine from pieces, from scratch. Thank you so much. And Verlana, as the you know, artistic director of Yara Arts Group, you've told many Ukrainian stories and other stories from um, Eastern Europe and other um, areas, but this is a different format for you as an artist, writer, director, and so um, you know, as someone who has told these stories in different ways, what, what was it like for you to work with Ping in this format as opposed to other ways that Yara has, has worked with you know, personal or traditional cultural stories? Uh, well, usually we have worked with other people's stories. I mean, sort of the people we forget about stories. But uh, so I've never really worked on a personal uh, narrative piece. Or we did like sort of in opposition to a historical narrative sort of. Um, and so when Ping approached me last spring about and said he thinks it's really important time to do something about Ukraine and to do an undesirable element about Ukraine, well, I couldn't say no, you know, at all. And uh, because I had seen some of the earliest ones and then some of the latest ones. Uh, because we're at La Mama and we always sing, see Ping, and I've actually worked on Ping Chang shows, but none of the in undesirable elements. I worked on Dejima and, and a few, Brightness, a few of the, the big sort of visual ones. Um, for me, uh, when he asked me about, you know, working on it, I said, I, uh, I, early on I thought, well, the thing I should really do is put together the people because Ukrainian history is very complicated and it's hard to tell and it's very diverse and I wanted to get both of that. So, you know, both have somebody from the very earliest immigrations and they're, uh, you know, totally different communities then from then like the post-World War II immigration and then the most recent people, I mean, Daria, I just met her this summer kind of. And, uh, and here's somebody who actually experienced the war that just broke out in her own apartment in Kiev. And, and then, you know, some of the people I've known uh, for a little bit, like Lesha I knew for a couple of years, Julian I've known for most of my life, I guess, <laughs> or for a good part of it, anyway. And, but just how to tell the big story of Ukraine through personal stories. I mean, although I didn't know what they were going to say, it was just to make that diverse group. And then, of course, we had to include Nariman. I mean, he is that very special Crimean Tatar friend we all have here. <laughs> <laughs> And everyone in their interview, just to speak to, you know, Verlana's role in this community, especially the new arrivals, everyone said, you know, Lesha said it and Daria said it, you know, when they came to New York and they said, how do I get involved in Ukrainian cultural community? Everyone said, you have to call Verlana. <laughs> and that was like a recurring theme in the interviews. You have to get to Verlana. Um, and then, you know, Verlana made those connections, which we're yeah. grateful for. And Ping. Um, uh, rumor has it you retired recently, <laughs> and uh, yet here you are, work, 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 as you like to say. So what was it about this piece that, um, you know, kept you coming back even though you're um, officially retired as the artistic director of Ping Chang and Company? I couldn't resist doing this project. Um, it's, you know, because the company's work has always been about addressing injustice. And what could be more obvious than the injustice, the horrendous injustice perpetuated against these people? So it was a natural, you know. I didn't think twice about it. And, and, I, and we, uh, Verlana and I have known each other for ages. And I just, so I said, I'm going to go talk to Verlana and see if she's on board to do this, you know. And she was, you know, she got the, the cast together in, in seconds. It was great. You know, thank you. Yeah, really. I want to add that in my thank you. you know. Yes, <laughs> Verlana made that outreach process amazing. Um, probably wasn't easy for you, but for us, it, it did come together very quickly. And um, I want to add that in my history. Very quickly. <laughs> in my history with Ping Chong and Company, after my internship with Ping Chong, um, Verlana gave me my first paid job in New York, 
1997, I ran the slide projector for a Yara <laughs> Arts show, and I, got, I think I got paid uh, $25, and it felt really rich. That was good. <laughs> so that was these nice. connections, you know, continue. Um, so, uh, Dr. Keats, one more question for you before we open it. Um, you know, having, having come to see the, the um, rehearsal and see the show tonight, and, you know, we've been talking about a lot this weekend around yeah, healing, and so we were talking about reclaiming narratives, but also, you know, from a kind of um, healing perspective, if you have any thoughts you want to share about the potential for these testimonies in, in healing, especially in a, in a situation that's ongoing. Yeah. Um, Actually, um, I was thinking about, you know, like for last two decades at least, the scholars are uh, speaking about Ukrainians as post-genocidal nation, post-genocidal society, because Ukrainians really survived three major genocides during the 20th century, in addition uh, to the, the devastating wars and to the bloody political repressions, including the Gulag, and thousands of people went through the Gulag, and many never returned. Uh, but all those collective traumas had never been worked through, because there was this conspiracy of silence for decades for two reasons, because on the one hand, the Soviet regime actually repressed any memories of all those crimes and everything which was uh, contradicting the, the Soviet narrative. But on the other hand, the survivors themselves kept silent because it was impossible for them to verbalize all those, um, all those traumatic experiences, unspeakable experiences. They were not prepared to, to talk about them. Um, and so the silence prevailed in the society and even in the, in the family settings. So, uh, I would say that uh, even after the survivors themselves in great majority passed away, it turned out that the collective trauma outlived them and all those atrocities and experiences of uh, dehumanizations, or dehumanization or uh, losses and suffering and pain uh, stayed with the, the subsequent generations. They they've been passed down to the children of, of those uh, genocides. Um, uh, and the, the research on the, on the post memories uh, of the Holocaust survivors and their descendants have proven, have shown us that those um, inherited traumas, collected traumas, they, they are very toxic. They could affect the lives and the identities of people in a very um, detrimental way. They could destroy them. So it's the healing process always comes with speaking out mm -hmm. those tr tub uh, troublesome memories. And without the possibility to talk, it is impossible to process those traumas, to get rid of them. And uh, for, for, for this narrativization of, of trauma, it is absolutely necessary to have a safe place uh, and also an audience which is prepared to listen and to engage with the story in a non-judgmental way. And this is the place created by Ping Chong. You know, for those a few courageous people who are prepared, who are willing and uh, uh, really wishing to tell their personal stories, their private family histories to become like public testimonies, to show the way for, for the others how one could deal with all those painful traumatic memories, how one could uh, work through them, how one could process them in order to overcome that painful past, in order to come to terms with with all those losses in order to be able to live further, to integrate that memory as um, in a constructive way, to become a part of our identity, not a burden, but a lesson to live with and to, to work further. So for me, this experience of um, speaking for millions of those who are unable to speak publicly or unable to even to verbalize 
whatever is painful inside of them. It's a very healing process, not only for the people who are sharing the stories and for the audience to, to empathize, but also for the, for the society at large, which seeks the way to deal with whatever was not processed in the past. So that's, for me, it's extremely um, efficient. I, I would use this way, you know, to work with the past. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we have a microphone here. If anyone has questions and you're able to get to the microphone, we'd love to invite you. It's easier for us to hear and for those who are um, live streaming to, to hear the question from the microphone. If you can't make it to the microphone, we can uh, sort of reflect it back. But so while you're thinking of your question, I'm gonna ask a, um, one more question of George and Julian about the, the text. So we, um, this was an excerpt, you know, this is a work in progress. This was our first public reading, so thank you everyone. They had a, I thought it went great. Um, and we are working towards a full presentation in May, um, hopefully at the Ukrainian Museum. And so, you know, there were lots of stories told in these interviews that actually didn't make it into this version of the script because we were, you know, on a, a time crunch and we had a certain amount of time tonight. So I'd just love to ask you, George, if there's one story that you're looking forward to telling in May um, and you the same, Julian. Ah. Well, I'm, I'm still so full of these that, it, that it's, it's hard to, um, there, there are a couple that, uh, it's, it's not that they weren't told, it's they're kind of hinted at or I, they, they will be fuller, you know yes. what I mean? There'll be more details. And I guess the one was uh, when, when my grandmother was, was hired as a domestic. Uh, it was months and months and months before she saw anyone and, and she was out on an errand and she ran into someone from her village and they said, uh, Katarina, why don't we ever see you at church? And she said, well, my employers told me that there were no churches in this country. So, uh, so after she, they said, no, there's a church here. So she went home and she packed her bags immediately and they said, well, why are you leaving it? And she said, well, you lied to me and I can't work for people who lied to me. So, uh, you know, that's my grandma. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Julian, we only scratched the surface of your life as a Rolling Stone musician. Is there a story or a moment that you're looking forward to well, sharing? Yeah, probably the, the biggest one is uh, you know, the story of uh, going back after, after spending half a lifetime uh, doing this, this Ukrainian music over here in North America. And um, after doing that for many years, uh, going for the first time to Ukraine and doing it there, uh, that was an, um, a really crucial moment for me to, uh, to understand um, you know, just, how, just how important it was, you know, what my family did and what I had been doing up till now, but also that now there were there were other people who were going to pick pick that up, you know. I didn't, uh, and it was also a moment when a lot of responsibility lifted off of me. I, I felt, and I could explore uh, my instrument in a much much freer way, uh, which has led me to a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now in uh, in New York City and theater music and you know and all, and all the rest of that. So, so that that story, I think, is. I mean, it's important to me. I hope it'll be interesting enough to, <laughs> to throw in. I have one thing yeah, to say, ahead. which is, in, while we were doing this um, uh, project with Rolana, um, one of the important things in this piece is about language, because it's it's about suppressing an, a language, and that's something that I I culturally understand myself. I'm, I speak Cantonese and um, mainland China wants to basically kill off our language. So I understand, I understand that in a very personal way. But one of the things that's interesting that um, is a byproduct of this process is that at one point, Verlana was talking about, I think you said, you said someone was from a part of Ukraine whose language is beautiful. I think it was Julian, right? Because of where he's from, which is not, uh, 
um, not the same as um, uh, in other areas. But also, Verlana said, and when she went to Ukraine for the first time, she was speaking a Ukrainian that was a kind of museum Ukrainian because it was, it had come to America a long time ago. And it was a, like museum Ukrainian, which is so interesting yeah. about People language. People said to me, ancient Ukrainian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just thank, wanted to mention yeah, that you. about language being very central to identity, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, I'd love to invite anyone to the microphone who has a question. Don't be shy. Come on down. We can wait for you. We can make a line. Just come on. <laughs> So this is Cecilia coming to the microphone. <laughs> so um, thank you so much. It was really amazing to see. But Oksana, um, the New School has a long legacy and history, important history of scholars in exile. And I understand that you are part of that history. I don't know if you are, but finding your way to the New School. But when I reached out to Oksana to come and to, to speak on the panel, she was, I'm not a theater person. I don't really know. <laughs> but, but your eloquence about oral history and about living memory, which I think theater is, um, was really very striking and powerful. But how is it that you found your way to the New School? And um, maybe let us know what kinds of courses you're teaching. <laughs> Thank you for the question, which a little bit distracts us from the point of the gathering today. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I was invited last spring uh, by the Department of Anthropology to come as a visiting professor for one year. And this is the year I'm here. Like from the previous semester, I was teaching a course, Women in Post-Socialist Transformations, based uh, on the three cases of Ukraine, Poland, and Russia. And because my main academic interest in my field of research is women's history and feminist anthropology. And this semester I'm teaching oral history actually um, at the anthropology department because oral history is a, a passion of my life. Uh, as was said, I was the co-founder of the Ukrainian Association of Oral History. So I practice oral history for more than two decades now. and. Um, as a scholar uh, doing uh, research in post-Soviet, post-totalitarian Ukraine, I'm very much aware of, of the power of human voices if those voices are made to be heard, not only for archives, which is important um, for scholarship, but also uh, when they are publicly presented. So they could bring about difference, they could change many things, especially when it comes to the social justice mm -hmm. um, and for, uh, for, for when it comes to the human values uh, for the humanity at large. So it is especially important uh, nowadays in the situation we all are witnessing and experiencing with this um, uh, bloody war unleashed by Russia against Ukraine. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the story behind Nesson, very special about my relationship with the new school. Um, but uh, on the other hand, there is a little story which is not related to oral history, but it is related to the feminist activism. Um, it is related to my, um, um, my let's say, friendship with Professor Ed Ann Snitov, who passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately, but who was um, one of the greatest advocates of women's rights in Central Eastern Europe and who uh, contributed enormously to raising awareness about gender inequalities there and helped many uh, women's uh, organizations and feminist movement to become stronger and to establish a good dialogue between East and West in terms of finding common language and understanding one another. And she helped uh, Ukrainian scholarship, feminist scholarship. So I had many encounters with her. So I, con I considered my teaching on women in post-socialist countries a kind of tribute to, to the memory of Ernst Nitov in a way. Thank you. We have another question. Come on, come on down. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, remarkable. My question, I, I think, is mainly for Ping. We, we spoke about George's um, experience as a professional actor, but it seemed that in this piece, in contrast to the other pieces we've been looking at this weekend, that all of the performers have some background in some form of performance. And I was curious uh, for you, did that in any way change the process, or was, was, there, was there an impact of that in the process of putting the piece together that made it different than others? Well, just uh, that I was delighted that there were musicians in it. Yes, I, uh, undesirable Elements, although it was a very strict uh, form, as Sarah likes to call it, like a sonnet, it's a very strict form, but there are actually um, possibilities of invention within this very strict form. And music, uh, we've had dance, we've had music, uh, we've had entire, when we did the show with the Congolese immigrants, the Congolese culture is a musical culture, so um, they all sang as choral music, uh, it was beautiful, you know, so um, um, even though they're performers, it's helpful, it's <laughs> easier, you know, it's less um, uh, effort to work with people who have a uh, stage experience, but basically we're telling the, uh, a human story which has, is not dependent on that. And we've had productions where uh, people have, who are not performers on, uh, at all and, and resisted any kind of uh, direction, but whose stories were still compelling. And that's the bottom line. Are, are, do they have a story that will connect to the audience? Uh, it's not really about the performing necessarily. We were yeah. talking with uh, Layla Modirzadeh, who's here somewhere. Where are you, Layla? Hi, Layla. Uh, who was moderating one of our earlier panels. So the piece that Layla was in in Seattle back in 1993 uh, was comprised of all actors because at the time it, you know, it was a union house and they had to already be in equity, I think, in order to do it. So we have had a few No, pieces. I don't think they were all actors. Were they? Uh, Bruce says yes. So, uh, so we've had a few situations where we've used performers, but what's uh, her name? Who came from the free town in Louisiana? With the Zora was not a performer. No. All right. Well, there's exceptions to every rule. Yeah. yeah, except for Zola. But that production was actually it wasn't it didn't need to be actors. I actually wanted to try one with all actors who had stories to tell. Yeah. That's actually what and happened. We like to say actors are people too. Or performers, so. yeah, actors <laughs> any, are people too. Any other questions? <laughs> any other questions from the group? Yes. I'll repeat it back for you so we can get it. So I'm just going to repeat it back for the live stream. What is the significance of the claps in the undesirable elements form? Um, the claps are, are a separation of each sto person's story, but it also uh, if it can also create like when we say you know um, they were killing people, clap. It's again a kind of punctuation of and also a suggestion of a gunshot or whatever. So it it is a kind of punctuation and. The, and the ten claps uh, signify something more significant. Um, in, this, in this iteration, because it was a short one, we cut the, some of the longer, we actually have longer claps in this, but because of time, I wanted to, to get the story in rather, and sacrifice those uh, for the time being. But they are kind of punctuations, and also the ten claps often used to, were used, often used to divide almost like a curtain for act one, act two, act three. When it was 10 claps, it was usually the end of a section. Um, but because we have music in here, we didn't need to do that so much uh, because those were kind of rests from the text. So it gave the audience a chance to um, use another um, uh, mode of, of communication. And so I, I didn't need to do the 10 claps all, all the time. It was, we only used it, I think, twice, once at the beginning before the chronological narrative begins, we had 10 claps. And then at the very end, before they named themselves, we had 10 claps. So it was almost like a curtain up, curtain down kind of effect. So it has multiple functions. If there was a car crash, you know, we'd do a clap, something like that too. 
Any other questions from the audience? I don't see any hands, so I think we can move towards closing. I think I'll just actually invite each of you maybe to share what's next for you between now and May when we're um, hopefully gathering for the full present presentation. I know, I think Verlana's going into rehearsal tomorrow <laughs> for a new project, so George, what's, what's next for you? Well, I'm working in Verlana's project. So, so you have I'm rehearsal <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> so I'm, I'll be at that rehearsal. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, while I'm rehearsing that, I'm also rehearsing um, my solo show, which is coming back in April, so two things at the same time. It's uh, a retelling of the Gospel of Mark as it would have been told in the first century. So, and Verlana, do you want to tell us a little bit about the show coming up? Uh, it's called Radio 477, and it is, um, I found uh, in an archive uh, a 1929 jazz score from Ukraine. Uh, 300 pages of music and about 100 words. And it, it was this legendary show, and so I asked uh, Sidhi Shadan, who's a Ukrainian writer, to work with us on creating text for it. And Anthony Coleman, who was the first person who said to me, well, it's a 20s musical, what do you think? You know, kind of deal. Uh, to uh, be the composer, because we reworked it. And so that's what we're working on, is putting that up about contemporary Kharkiv because it's one of the cities that really stood up very early in the war and sort of despite everybody thinking well Kharkiv's kind of Russian speaking it's going to just you know Putin thought it was a he's going to be an easy win it's only 10 miles from the border and they really both took the brunt and then uh, pushed the Russian army out and it's about that and it's going to be at La Mama? It's going to be at La Mama in March, March 10th through 19th. And it's a lot of music. And Dr. Keese, is there a project that you're working on that you want to share? Uh, actually, this semester I continue to, to teach oral history. I really hope that my students will be able to attend the full-scale performance, the entire, uh, the, the complete version of, of this performance because it's absolutely a um, unique experience would be for them to see how oral history could work in public. But besides of that, I, I will be speaking on different occasions on the Ukrainian women's experiences of this present day war in Ukraine and on changing images, public images of a women uh, serv military servicemen. So I will be giving several public talks all over the place in North America. Thank you. Ping, what's next for you? Well, well I'm going back to finish the script <laughs> <laughs> and doing more research. Yeah. So that's my, my and uh, getting you know ready for um, May, the first weekend of May at the Ukrainian Museum with everybody in the cast. And hope and Daria will be back by then. We hope. And yes. so she's got lots of stories to tell that I have to um, get from her as well. And Julian, what about you? What's next for you? Well, immediately I have to go to that same rehearsal, okay. <laughs> and uh, and I'll. Uh, but I have only a little little thing to do. I'm going to record a little spoken part uh, for that comes from off stage. Um, but um, after that, uh, uh, a teaching and uh, and performing trip to Nova Scotia uh, okay. for for a while. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. No, I just wanted to thank uh, the New School for um, hosting uh, this anniversary of Undesirable Elements and everyone here. I want to thank the cast, Leisha and Nariman and George and Julian. Did I miss anybody? Nancy. Verlana. Nancy. Nancy, Nancy. Nancy. Who read for Daria. Um, and, uh, for everyone's uh, generosity of spirit and openness to a stranger and telling me their stories. Thank you so much. And Oksana for joining us on stage. So this is uh, <laughs> going to conclude our evening. Thank you, Ping just did our thanks. So uh, you know, thank you again to Eugene Lane College, the College of the Performing Arts at New School, uh, Stephen, Cecilia, Victoria Abrash, who really curated yes, this two-day symposium. Oh, yeah. um,
I want to give a special shout out to Antonio de la Vega, who was our amazing production intern. Yes. And uh, please, uh, you know, follow Ping Chong and Company, follow Yara Arts Group, um, keep in touch with us. And uh, the next Undesirable Elements is happening in uh, Reston, Virginia in March. So if, if anyone's in, Reston, in the DC area, I'm leaving next week to go. I need to write the script. But we are uh, doing the next Undesirable Elements. The series is continuing. Uh, and we look forward to celebrating many more years. So thank you and again. Thanks, Vlad, thanks, for your wonderful sound. Yes, thank you, Vlad. Yeah, I'm